Good morning, everybody. I, I just stood up and everybody got quiet. Can, that does not work at my house. Well, I'm, com, I'm Russell McMurray. I'm the commissioner of the Georgia Department of Transportation, and I want to thank you all for attending today here in person or online, and I'll try to make sure I look into the camera from time to time. We had over 600 restaurants to this participation today, so I think that's pretty strong. So give your hand, give yourselves a round of applause. And that applause is necessary because we're super excited to share with you some critical updates as it relates to the major mobility improvement program. One of the nation's largest programs going today. And at first, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of one of our state transportation board members, Mr. Kevin Abels. Kevin, would you stand? Kevin is our chair of our P3 committee through the state transportation board. And Kevin, thank you for your support being here today and your support of the MMIP program. Just a few quick notes. Yeah, we'll give Kevin a round of applause. That's always good. State transportation board members are my bosses. So, uh, and we have we have others online as well as I understand. So thank them for, for for their participation today. Just a few quick updates about Georgia. Traffic volumes have bounced back to pre-COVID-19 levels. And in fact, congestion is back. That's why we're here today. Truck volumes are at an all time high. Uh, with the supply chain reorienting in the e-commerce growth that has been exponential across the nation, but here in Georgia with the Port of Savannah and the Port of Brunswick, we've seen tremendous volume growth in tractor trailer and commercial vehicle traffic. Our economy is very strong. In fact, just recently, Georgia was ranked for the eighth year in a row, the number one state to do business. And I think that's maybe why you're sitting in these seats today and watching this online. As an example of that economic growth, Rivian, the electric vehicle manufacturer, just announced back in December a $5 billion investment in Georgia. I thought somebody was ripping the carpet up. That's feedback. Let me try to adjust a little bit. Rivian announced a $5 billion investment with over 7,500 jobs coming into Georgia just right out I-20 past the East Interchange and the 285 Express Lane. So a huge investment in our state's economy. Our state budget is strong. In fact, we have a state budget hearing tomorrow with the House for our fiscal year 23 budget. And of course, we all look forward to the increased funding as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law. So Georgia's outlook remains strong and I'm bullish on Georgia's future. Now let's look at the roadmap for this morning. Uh, I will start with a little bit of an overview and a background on the MMIP. And then next, Chris Tomlinson, the executive director of the State Road and Tollway Authority and the Atlanta Transit Link Authority, will talk about tolling and the transit vision as it relates to the MMIP. Following Chris, Meg Perkle, the chief engineer for the Georgia Department of Transportation, We'll provide you some detail about our view of partnership, and that's why you're here today is for the partnership. Tim Matthews, our state express lanes administrator, will then next lay out the details of the approach and details of the express lane projects. This is your camera moment where you pull your phones out. Just kidding, we'll post this presentation so you can view it, so don't pull your phones out. Don't be ordering anything online unless it's originated in Georgia. Next, Daryl Van Meter, the Assistant Division Director of P3 and Alternative Delivery, will provide updates on the non-Express Lane MMIP projects, many of which are major projects, of course, as well. And then Meg Perkle will come back and wrap it up, providing you the MMIP schedule and close with final remarks. So that's our roadmap and agenda for this morning. So let's move forward. And as I was thinking about today, I thought it was important, you know, that we're sharing where we're going today, but I thought it would be important to remind ourselves and you of where we where we started. The MMIP was born out of a vision after the passage of HB 170 back in 2015. That funding bill's primary objective was to take care of state of good repair. 
But back then in 2016, we knew that we still needed to address mobility in a significant way. So that's where we began to look for alternative delivery methods to accomplish this, either using DB or design bill finance, or ultimately D bombs with availability payments was our approach. Back then, we ran multiple scenarios through our financial models of projects and financial models to determine what could we minimally afford that provided uh, yielded good mobility improvements. And out of that was born the 11 original MMIP projects, uh, it, which certainly moved the needle on mobility uh, when we did that analysis. Now, I'm very proud to say that we have one of those projects that is open to traffic. We have three in the D and C phase right now, and one in the final stages of procurement with proposals under review for award on the East Interchange right, right now. So don't ask us about that. We can't talk about it. Now, lots has changed since 2015, and we haven't lost our focus on ensuring the major projects are delivered as promised. And with all programs, right, they continue to grow and evolve, and we've continued to make adjustments as necessary. So today, this will certainly help solidify the future, and we know that we'll have even a greater impact on mobility by this by our efforts here on uh, the MMIP as we move forward. Now, I hope you would all agree that we listen to you, we learn from you, and we steal from other states. That's true. The reason we do that is so that we can provide the best approach to deliver this infrastructure to Georgia, the Georgia way, if you will. So we thank you for your partnerships and your patience as we continue to evolve. I know that with our refinements and the adjustments that we will share today, you will see how we've adapted to things like market risk appetite, the current inflationary pressures we're all facing, COVID impacts, and let's hope that is waning. Who, who ever thought force majeure was gonna be a, such a big topic several years ago, right? and the positive effects of the bipartisan infrastructure law. So as we've listened, learned, and involved in the pursuit of the delivery of the MMIP, we want to say thank you again for all of you who have engaged with us. And if I look at this audience, and I, I can't tell looking online, but we've met with a large number of you because we want to be open and responsive and get those best ideas. Our major change we announced last year was the moving away from the availability payment approach on the 285 express lane projects. In addition, we had a thorough analysis of the AP approach we took on State Route 400 after not awarding State Route 400 last year. I want you all to know we don't take any of these project decisions lightly. We understand that you're making business decisions, big business decisions, on what information we provide and how we respond. And we also understand these pursuits are very costly. We take it very seriously. I'm also proud, though, that our team has advanced many advanced improvement projects that provides improvements along 285 for our travelers in advance of the express lanes. And then on 400, some make ready work in advance of the express lane projects on 400. So we've continued to try to advance what we can, when we can. Now next, I wanna share with you our overall philosophy, if you will, to the approach of projects. Our goal was simple, to maximize project value. I love our director of planning statement, Janine Miller, who says, building better infrastructure for a growing Georgia is our mission. And that's what we're trying to do is maximize project value. So let me share some of the details of the components we feel are important to maximize project value. These components will ultimately show up in RFPs. And let me speak to just a few of these in no particular order except the first one. We always start with safety just like you do. And we know that the ultimate 285 express lane projects will provide improved safety. We know that with the revised approach over 285, the improved safety will be much greater than our original project, which only included 
buffer separations and not barrier separations. But equally important to our approach to safety is your approach to safety during construction and then ultimately in operations. As one as certainly as our first component. Now let me talk about improved mobility. Well, that's pretty simple. That's the purpose and need of all these projects. But we view that in a larger frame as well as improved mobility is for all users and across all modes in these corridors. Part of that improved mobility certainly will come from the enhancing the current transit that utilizes these corridors uh, and through the projects. And you'll hear from Chris Tomlinson later about the vision of new transit in these corridors and these projects. Next, let me speak to equity. Much of the 285 express lane projects and the I-20 285 interchange projects are adjacent to minority communities. And our collective approaches must not only not adversely impact these communities, but rather try to enhance them. All around 285, we know that our work around 285 by providing the same number of minimum lanes is certainly the first step in the equity solution for the 285 projects, but by providing two lanes around the whole corridor where before we could only afford one lane on the east and west walls. And we look forward to your continued engagement and your approach on addressing equity in these projects. We are very supportive of innovation, and you'll see a renewed focus and openness to the ATC process where you bring great alternatives to us uh, for implementation. Now, with such a large program, we acknowledge that the industry must grow and workforce development will be critical to for success. We understand the current challenges with labor and workforce. We have them too. We will value your approaches of the development of workforce and especially our focus on DBE inclusion, mentor protege and other innovative approaches to support DBE minority participation in these projects in the overall MMIP program. Our view of express lane projects are truly of long term partnerships, not purely transactional relationships. As such, we look to optimize the use of public funding to achieve the stated project goals, many of which look very much like this chart we're looking at. These are the considerations of how we will approach public subsidies, which will likely vary on a project by project basis. In conclusion, we want to provide maximum project value for all. And as I mentioned while discussing the workforce development need, the implementation of MMIP is a very sustainable long term endeavor on top of a very solid state and federal design bid build program that we have here in Georgia. This slide is just an illustrative example. Let me repeat that. This slide is an illustrative example. Do we have that stamped on there? We need to put a big red stamp. The project value curves over 10 plus years. And I might add that we have more projects to add on top of the current MMIP projects. And you'll see a slide later from Tim Matthews about our total managed lane implementation plan, which includes more than 285 and 400. What we want out of this slide is for you to feel good about the long term workload here in Georgia on top of our base program, and it is certainly a big program. Now to be successful in delivering a large program, it takes partnerships and our mobility partnerships are strong. Our primary partnership obviously is with the State Road and Tollway Authority, but just as important is working with the Atlanta Transit Link Authority and MARTA where we collectively share a vision of mobility improvement for all users. GDOT will advance these projects with pre-led activities, manage the procurement, and which will then lead to the DNC period. SERTA, of course, is the contract holder and has certain tolling activities and, of course, is responsible for the existing express lane operations. The ATL and MARTA, as well as Fulton County's and DeKalb County's master transit plans include a vision of BRT utilizing the express lanes instead of the fixed guideway. And you'll hear more from Chris Tomlinson in a moment about that. So we're very thankful for these strong partnerships and we very much value these strong partnerships listed on this slide to advance these projects. 
So with that, let me introduce the executive director of the state toll, uh, state roadway and state road, Chris, state road and tollway authority, of which I'm a board member. Huh? Maybe not for much longer. And the Atlanta Transit Link Authority. So Chris, come on up. He's going to talk to you about the formal relationship we share contractually, and then the discussing of tolling on the express lanes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and I think Russell did an excellent job of really setting the stage for what we're doing, for what we've learned uh, over the last few years as we continue to refine this. And now I want to talk a little bit, as Russell said, about our vision for both the tolling and the transit aspects. But I want to start before I dive into the vision. Let's make sure we're all on the same page with the, the basic construct of uh, which really reflects some of the partnerships and the relationships. So what you see on the slide is a diagram. And for those of you who have been familiar with GDOT's P3 program over the years, you've seen this slide before. I point that out to let you know that we are taking a proven, known, and consistent approach to our P3 program. And what we're talking about with uh, this, this particular set of projects is the further refinement enhancement based on what we, we know and what we know has worked well. So in between uh, GDOT and CERTIF, there's a number of legal uh, documents that help define our relationship. And I just wanted to walk through why they're all there and make sure everyone has that context. First, we have a joint resolution that declares each of these projects as a partnership, a, a joint project. GDOT is in control of the program. GDOT is in control of the projects. I'm going to elaborate on that a bit. But more importantly, at these early stages, both the board, the State Transportation Board and the CERTA board get together and recognize that this is all in furtherance of bettering, improving, and expanding the infrastructure of uh, Georgia's uh, roadways. Next is the state for years. I'm sure there are a couple of attorneys out there. Some people refer to it as a ground lease. This is simply giving certain rights to CERTA to go ahead and work on the project, thus enabling us to bring forward CERTA's flexibility in terms of both its financing powers as well as eventually its tolling powers. Third, an intergovernmental agreement. This is the document in between GDOT and CERTA that defines its roles and responsibilities in working relationships. Again, this is based on our track record of delivering successful capital projects in the P3 format, um, but it's always good to have that documented and well known. Next is an annual funding MOU, a document which allows us each year as budgets are set to make sure we have a mechanism to transfer the appropriate monies uh, that may have to go from GDOT to CERTA and eventually to the developer. Now, as between CERTA and the developer, two very key documents. One is the project agreement. That will be the document, the P3 project agreement itself. Uh, this is what you would find in other states. Uh, this is something that we've been uh, working on and will really define that relationship between uh, CERTA and really the state and the developer. And last but not least is the tolling services agreement. And I'll talk specifically about that uh, because we're really doing something different for the first time here in terms of how the roles and responsibilities as it relates to tolling these projects will work. That dash line, project management oversight. For a lot of you who are focused on just getting the project built, on a day-to-day -day basis, you will be working with the Georgia Department of Transportation through its processes, its people, its forms. Again, we are leveraging that long track record of successfully delivering large, complex capital projects. So on a day-to-day -day basis, if you've done business with GDOT, if you understand how DOTs work with the contracting community, you'll recognize and be very familiar with our approach to the projects. CERTA will be involved uh, specifically with the flow of certain payments, and then of course, in that tolling relationship. So let's talk about that. 
we're taking a different approach to tolling than we've done on our other P3 projects. The Northwest Corridor was a P3 project, but as you know, once the, the construction was complete, the tolling operations were done exclusively by CERTA. In these sets of projects, we're going to have a, a different approach. The developer will have the responsibility, the ability, and therefore the flexibility to operate the roadside tolling system. That, that means they'll have the responsibility for creating what we know we call an operational back office, but that part of what it takes in order to be able to set tolls, price tolls, and charge tolls for trips. CERTA will still be a part of the tolling operation because once the developer has priced those uh, trips, they will pass that information to CERTA for it to be placed on the same bill uh, for any other Peach Pass customers who are taking trips either on the developer roadways or for the existing um, four toll projects that we have. Now, CERTA serves as the tolling authority. We'll bring that flexibility because statutorily we have the ability to provide and, and therefore uh, delegate tolling authority to the uh, private developer. We will run the Peach Pass, uh, what's known as the commercial back office, but the billing system, handling the phone calls that come in from customers who are utilizing the roadways, thereby allowing the developer to focus on managing the performance on that roadway, identifying the trips. But the customer service functions will come over uh, and be performed by CERTA. And we will take that approach uh, for the developer roadways in the exact same way as we do for CERTA operated roadways. Our goal is to have the most seamless experience for the users. And also, this is about revenue risk. This is about sharing the risk, letting the developers focus on their roadways and what they do best, letting us focus on the customer service experience for all uh, motorists who utilize the roadways. Violation processing. Um, everyone's going to have a peach pass, so there'll be no violations, so there's no need to talk about that. <laughs> no, we, again, it's the same philosophy. We want to take a uniform approach, uh, working with the developer, but most importantly, providing a single uh, interface or point of contact for customers. Um, and therefore, it is anticipated that CERTA would handle any type of violations or enforcement. Last, CERTA is a toll authority is bringing forth not only its tolling expertise, but some of its financing powers. And as we continue to work through this program, as we look at the different um, financing opportunities and options available to both the state and developers, uh, excuse me, CERTA may bring forward uh, some of its financing powers to allow certain types of financing to be made available for use by developers to consider in their overall financing plan and approach. All of these relationships it will be governed by contract terms and the contracts that are put in place, be they in that project agreement I mentioned earlier or in the uh, tolling services agreement. But within the framework, developers will have a high degree of flexibility to operate, manage, and of course maintain these projects as they would so they can uh, maximize the performance of those projects for all the motors that use them. When we talk about who's using this project, and one of the things I'm very proud of the uh, state of Georgia is from the outset, we've looked at these projects, these corridors, as being multimodal in nature. Um, I recently spoke to the local chapter of the American Society of uh, Highway Engineers, and I was just reminding them that in large part, a lot of those uh, engineers and professionals are now going to be in the business of designing the next guideways uh, for transit. We believe that these lanes will be multimodal in their approach, and they will not only benefit the toll paying customers, but will provide benefits for not only the existing transit that's in that corridor, there is transit and local bus service using those corridors today, but will allow for the expansion of new options such as uh, bus rapid transit. So again, as the slides shows, it will prove existing transit operations, It'll provide the ability for toll free uh, use of the lanes by uh, transit vehicles. 
and we think because of this program and because of the impact it will have, it will help support and spur uh, transit-oriented development, a key economic component uh, for the region. Looking specifically to the I-285 express lanes, I want you to know that this is more than just theoretical. Um, we have been working in conjunction with our partners at the local level, um, be they MARTA or the local communities. Um, we've been in, engaged with over seven different mayors from seven different towns who touch 285, as well as the counties uh, that are involved, as well as counties that don't even physically touch 285, but recognize the regional importance. So we are, we've been building off of a transit study that was done by this uh, mayor's group. And now we're about to get to the next step in our conceptual design process for what may look like uh, transit, what transit may look like on I-285. Literally, as I stand up here and speak, uh, a joint funding and collaboration MOU is being circulated amongst eight signatories. Um, they are CERTA, they're the ATL, uh, GDOT, the Atlanta Regional Commission, and the counties of Cobb, Gwinnett, Fulton and DeKalb, all working towards the same goal, same premise of how best can we leverage the 285 express lanes projects to help support and accommodate transit that would run in those lanes. And so we're very proud of that, and you'll hear more about that over the upcoming uh, weeks and months. Collectively, as you can see at the bottom, we are convinced that I-285 express lanes will facilitate more reliable transit coordination of potential express lane transit and BRT options. And so collectively, this really is our vision for both the transit and tolling components of this project. And we're looking forward to working with many of you in this room to go from vision to reality. And with that, I will pass it off to uh, Meg Perkle, Chief Engineer. Thank you, Chris. And good morning, everyone. It's great to be here today with all of you, and I get to talk about what I think is the most exciting part of our message, the third P, or partnership, and how we've been working diligently for the last six months to review and revise our contract terms to enhance our partnership. In May of 2021, GDOT announced a pivot from an availability payment model P3 on the I-285 express lanes to a revenue risk model. This announcement also included adding additional express lanes on the east and west walls of I-285 to provide two lanes in each direction for all of the I-285 express lane projects. Since that time, we've continued with project development on all of our express lane projects to advance the new procurement model. We are developing system-wide traffic and revenue studies and coordinating all of these changes in our planning documents. We are continuing to advance acquisition of right-of-way and revising the NEPA documents to for each project to be aligned with the final project packaging and the new procurement strategy. We've also given much consideration to the Georgia 400 Express Lanes project and the best way forward to move ahead with procurement. We've made a lot of progress in delivering the MMIP, and we have five construction contracts underway. This slide shows the remaining MMIP projects that are still in the pre-development phase and shows the engineering firms under contract with GDOT to move these projects ahead to procurement. And the message I want to convey with this slide is that GDOT has a lot of people working to deliver the MMIP. The plan development and environmental for these projects has continued full steam ahead through this transition. Since last summer, we have engaged with industry and performed market sounding to really get an understanding of the distribution of risk in our projects and agreements. We have identified market constraints or conditions that would limit competitive interest. We've listened to your feedback on key commercial issues and preliminary procurement options. 
and we've obtained lessons learned, or as Russell says, stealing from other public sponsors of revenue risk projects. GDOT and CERTA's goal through this process is to approach risk differently than we have in the past and place risk where it is best and most appropriately managed. I'd like to walk you through some key risk areas where we have heard from industry and worked to address your concerns. Differing site conditions, also known as geotechnical. We recognize that bidders need to develop designs based on information available at the time of bid and that facilitating additional information during the procurement process will assist in refining design and cost estimates. More broadly, unanticipated conditions on the site represent a low probability risk. And GDOT is seeking to reduce unnecessary contingencies around geotechnical risk. Materials escalation. That's really been a topic recently, hasn't it? Across the country, materials pricing has experienced significant volatility recently. The project agreement will include indexing mechanisms to share in fluctuations to reduce uncertainty in direct costs around core construction materials over the construction period. Utilities, always a hot topic. GDOT is evaluating the approach to agreements between utility owners and developers and contractors to simplify this process. It is our intent to introduce a risk sharing regime that fits more precisely with the developer's ability to pursue costs for impacts from delays from utility owners during construction. We also want to make the most of the ongoing relationships that GDOT already has with utility owners in Georgia. Right of way. We've heard from you that this is a big risk item and we are being responsive to your concerns. GDOT will continue to advance right-of-way acquisition during the procurement process. Our goal is that the majority of the parcels on a project will be acquired by GDOT prior to award. Allocation of the developer acquired and GDOT acquired right-of-way is under review on each project with intense focus currently on the State Route 400 corridor. Non-compliance regime. We need to be able to manage the contract, but we don't want unnecessary perceived risk to drive up contingency costs. We have reevaluated our approach to the non-compliance regime, including non-compliance events, cure periods, any monetary penalties, and increased oversight and default thresholds. We are also evaluating carefully the differing need and purpose of the non-compliance regime between the design and construction period and the operate and maintain period. Dispute review boards. This is new for Georgia. We've heard from developers and understand the importance and benefit of an independent review board to engage on complex technical issues. The dispute review board will be an optional step prior to mediation. Pandemic events, big shock here. This is definitely on the forefront of all of our minds we understand the uncertainty and potential impacts that COVID or other pandemic impacts can have on the ability to deliver projects. And GDOT will provide relief and share and schedule impacts by providing compensation for financing costs arising out of delays. Early works. GDOT appreciates the benefit of advancing meaningful works after contract execution and during the financial close period. And furthermore, the benefit to pay for these allowed activities rather than the developer and its contractors undertaking the work at risk. The approach is intended to help mitigate some scheduled pressure on the early stages of the design and development phase, providing an overall benefit to the project. So as you can see, we have made substantial progress in developing a balanced approach to risk sharing. For each procurement, we will provide details of these items in indicative term sheets in the RFQ phase. Please know that we will continue to work and engage with industry to manage risk sharing. I'd also like to highlight organizational changes in the last year under the chief engineer and in the P3 division at GDOT. We are working to deliver a major P3 program effectively and efficiently. We've enhanced our GDOT organization to include two new deputy chief engineers, Andrew Heath and Mark Mastronardi, who's here with us today. 
Mark will be engaged directly with our P3 delivery program. We've also added a new Office of Express Lanes led by Tim Matthews under the P3 Division Director Joe Carpenter. The Express Lanes Office will lead the development of Express Lane projects on I-285 and Georgia 400 and any other corridors where Express Lanes become, become our future and get planned. Last, Daryl Van Meter will continue to deliver any other P3 and design build projects in the newly renamed Office of Alternative Delivery. I'm excited about this new structure that will bring more folks to the table to focus on complex P3s and alternative delivery projects. And with that, I'll hand the podium over to Tim Matthews, State Express Lanes Administrator, to highlight our plans for procurement of 400 and 285. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And I'll be honest, when leadership said, do you want to participate in this event? I said, sure, why not? That was before I knew 600 people were going to be here. So, but at the end of the day, thank you very much for being here. Um, hopefully this is very informative and uh, well worth your while coming here today. The Express Lanes vision is still the vision that we had uh, mentioned earlier with commissioner and others with, with regards to the MIP program. And since last August, people think we put our pencils down and haven't been doing anything. Trust me, we've been very, very busy. A lot of work's been going on behind the scenes to recognize this change in procurement model and how we want to deliver this program. But more importantly, listen to the industry and find out what you guys need to help deliver this program for us. And uh, what we found is this is not just 285 express lanes or State Route 400 express lanes. It's actually more than that. This is a regional approach to how we want to manage mobility and congestion issues in our region. And what you see on the screen highlights that very notion that we're trying to bring forward. You see we have existing corridors of express lanes already open to traffic with Northwest Corridor, I-85, and the 75 Metro South express lanes. In addition to that, bringing forward 285 express lanes as well as the State Route 400 express lanes. But beyond that, we have a vision that is planned and programmed in the TIP and STIP with the I-20 express lanes that you see on the screen there in yellow, as well as a gap project connecting the South Metro express lanes with 285 on the south side of town. Altogether, maximizing value for Georgia and the users of these express lanes. One of some of the things we're bringing forward with those uh, maximizing value is safety improvements, bringing two express lanes in each direction on 285, on the east and west, as well as bringing a barrier separation between those express lanes as well. Additional capacity, as I mentioned there, enhance access and connectivity to express lanes. We have costing plans and a concept out there for access on these express lanes, but we wanna make sure that we bring and allow innovation for you as developers to bring potentially new access points to these corridors as well. Uh, obviously a customer focused approach. We've had tremendous success, and Chris can talk about this a lot with our existing express lanes. People love the express lanes because they get reliable trip times on these corridors. Chris talked about transit. They, we have transit service providers in some of these corridors, but it's very limited because you can't get the reliable trip times that's necessary for people to want to get into the system or in those transit service providers. We believe express lanes is going to offer that opportunity, and we've seen that success already on our express lanes. So, we believe, as mentioned earlier, that these express lanes are vital to helping transit uh, grow into the future. And then obviously we've mentioned uh, that we spoke with you over the last six to eight months to try to learn how, what's the best way to deliver this program and these projects such that you can be responsive to what we're trying to deliver here in Georgia and into the region. Uh, we recognize that you can't widen your way out of congestion on these type of projects is too much uh, uh, to do. So we believe express lanes is the right approach as we move forward on this program. We're reshaping the express lane delivery around the DBFOM revenue risk model. Again, as the commissioner talked about earlier, shifting from an availability payment model to a revenue risk model. We think that's the best way to maximize value for these projects and not only for the state, but I think for the developers as well. Uh, we wanna maximize competition. Uh, like I said, we spent eight months trying to figure out how to how to package these projects and put them out for you to be responsive. And people kept asking me, when are you gonna tell me? When are you gonna tell me? We didn't wanna rush it. We wanted to make sure we took our time and put something out that we think sustainable and, and for you to be able to respond to, and again, maximize that value. Optimal use of public funding, Commissioner talked about earlier. 
that's going to vary by project, uh, depending on the project, how that subsidy may look and, and, and be perceived. So building and operating segments. These are mega projects, you know, billions and billions of dollars. It has to be right size. We heard that from you, the industry, right size these projects to make sure that you can build them and ultimately open these traffic projects to traffic and, and get them operating. Uh, network operating efficiencies. They need to be efficient when we operate them. We recognize we can't necessarily open, open them all at once, so they have to open by project segment and operate efficiently. We recognize market capacity. There's, there's a very small market out there. I know there's a lot of people on here and it takes a lot of uh, teams to put these projects forward, but we recognize market capacity and want to be responsive to that as, as, as it relates to that. And then ultimately schedule. We also recognize you can't put all these projects out at once overlapping each other. Resources just can't sustain that. So we're going to make sure we put a right schedule out there for you to be responsive. Some key elements. Uh, these are going to be 50 year operating terms. There's a lot more behind that. We'll, we'll let you know what that looks like when the operating term actually starts and how that, that works. But in general, we think 50 years is the right approach at this time. Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, market-based variable tolling. Uh, so that, that regime will be set out in the toll services agreement so you understand how that process will work under those contract terms. Accommodation for enhanced transit option. Chris talked about that and I talked earlier. That's important for us here in the state to make sure we accommodate that. And we expect you to be responsive to that when it comes out to the RFP is concerned. Uh, operation and maintenance, how's that going to look? For certain projects, it may be a little bit different, but in general, we think fence to fence is the right approach. Again, may vary by project, but in general, uh, fence to fence is what we're looking at from an ONM perspective. And then public funding, uh, availability by project. It depends on the project and what available funds are there for a subsidy, but we will detail that out on each project as they move forward into the future. So what have we been doing? We've been very busy, not only with procurement strategies and packaging strategies, but the projects have been moving forward between right away, uh, costing plans, engineering and otherwise. We've moved this program forward over the past eight months. We've, as you may know, State Route 400, the environmental document is approved. We're going through a reevaluation uh, at this time for the advanced bridges that are going to be built on that project. But in general, it's ready to go uh, and we're going to move that project forward. The individual permit for the Corps of Engineers is complete and uh, we're going to move that project forward. Not me, I promise. Uh, I-285 top in. Uh, that project, we don't expect the scope to change on that. It was always two lanes, barrier separated in each direction, and it's still going to be barrier separated two lanes in each direction. However, as Meg talked about earlier, and we've uh, pushed out 285 east and west, that will convert from one lane in each direction to two lanes in each direction. So obviously we'll have to look at the tie-in points to the top end project, as well as the environmental and right away on the east and west side to make sure that we can accommodate those two lanes barrier separated in each direction. And again, those ongoing costs and plans, uh, the engineering plans, as well as the NEPA documents will be brought forward to accommodate that effort. Now on the State Route 400. This project will be going first and you'll see in a little bit later the schedule on how that's going to work. Uh, we're going to start this project as a new procurement as a standalone revenue rest concession project. That's that's the model we're going to use here. The scope and limits are going to remain the same. We do not anticipate any changes there. That doesn't mean we don't want innovation. We want you guys to bring innovation to these projects even though we, we have a, a set scope here. Um, availability, uh, available public funding amounts will be uh, detailed at RFP. Uh, there are some funding available for this project from a subsidy perspective, and it will advance prior to the I-285 uh, express lanes. Again, you can see on the, on the right there that the scope is there, the access points are still there. Recognizing innovation is important to us and to you, and we want that for these projects moving forward. Express lane transit, the notion there has not changed. Uh, ELT is MARTA's preferred transit alternative uh, and included in the Fulton County Transit Plan. So a lot of work has gone on in the past to make sure that transit in some sort of way is accommodated on this corridor. And as you can see, a lot of work there for us, the department, to not preclude that transit opportunity is brought forward. So that is going to stay on this project as well uh, in the form of BRT, bus rapid transit, as adopted by MARTA and Fulton County. Funding is available for the construction of the BRT accommodations and infrastructure. Uh, again, how much gets built will depend on how, what we put in the RFP. And then 
your preliminary station designs, which is underway by MARTA right now, will be put uh, into costing plans as well as RID reference information documents. So we will put as much information that MARTA is planning from an infrastructure perspective at the stations into this document so you can be responsive to that. And again, commitments to advance and advancing transit elements to, to be considered in a developer selection. All right, here's the schedule. Uh, we're going to publish the notice of intent to advertise tomorrow, so you'll see that information coming out. We're going to hold an industry forum, which is going to be published online. It's not going to be in person. It's going to be recorded, so you'll be able to see that on March 7th or earlier. We're looking at bringing that up ahead of March 7th. We're going to have one-on-one -on -one meetings the week of March 7th through the 9th. That can, it's going to be offered in person or virtual, whatever your choice is. And uh, we're going to advertise the RFQ on March 31st of this year. Expect to announce the shortlist or finalist in August of 2022. Release the draft RFP in September 2022. Uh, proposals due or excuse me, uh, release draft RFP March 2023. Proposals due June 2023 with developer se selection in August 2023. So that's what you can expect when it comes to State Route 400 procurement schedule. Moving on to I-285. As I said earlier, um, this approach, and as Meg mentioned last year and even today, we are going to use a design, build, uh, finance, operate, maintain revenue risk approach for this these projects as well. The I-285 ex express lanes uh, will be split into east and west projects. You'll so two separate projects, each comprised of multiple segments. We recognize and hearing from the industry that we can't build all these at once. It's too big of a package. So we're going to make sure that they're developed in segments. As initial segments for each project uh, will be competitive hard bids with uh, subsequent segments delivered through negotiated extensions. And I'll show you in just a minute what that looks like. So two hard bids with extension options uh, on, those cor on that corridor. Uh, we believe it's going to encourage competition, maximize competition as well as, but minimize the number of separate developer operators on these corridors, which can be very challenging to manage in the long term. Uh, reduces the number of major procurements uh, on, the, on these projects, right sizing these projects so that the construction package and the operating segments can, can be open in the interim before the entire project is complete. Uh, offers uh, opportunities for a range of contractors to participate. We believe it maximizes that opportunity for uh, lots of uh, uh, folks to participate and it allows for clear, reasonable sequencing of segment delivery, maximizes value of express lanes uh, for Georgia and its users. So that's the reason we're taking this approach. We think it's the right approach uh, for, for the state as well as the industry. So here's what, what we uh, have shown here, what it looks like. Initial segments for I-285 East and West express lanes will be procured separately. And on that blue, just below 400, what you see is what we're calling the inverted T is gonna be the, the second project after 400 uh, to go first in the procurement with an extension option to the east. And obviously, you know, that will depend on the negotiation process of that, of that procurement on how that operates with the ability for the state, if we can't reach an agreement for that extension to procure that as a separate hard bid project. The third project after 400 and the, the inverted T will be the top in west there down to Atlanta Road in yellow. That again, will have an extension option taking you down to I-20 uh, into the future. Uh, we anticipate the initial I-285 East segment uh, will begin procurement in summer 2023 and the initial West procurement in fall of 2024. So that in a high level is what we're anticipating for 285 when it comes to hard bid and the extension options on 285 moving forward. With that, and Meg will talk about uh, more about the schedule as a whole with all the program moving forward. With that, I'll turn it over to Daryl to give you an update on P3 division. Thank you, Tim, and great job. Uh, great job. I know Tim has been working really hard with his team to to uh, be prepared for this day. And uh, so the uh, the I two eighty five West interchange project has advanced in readiness. As many of you know, the project provides improved safety operational features, including a westbound distributor 
collector distributor to facilitate the smoother smooth transition of traffic from 285 as well as eastbound improvements uh, leading to 285. <clears throat> of course the removal of the left hand exits and reorganizing the directional movements for better efficiency will greatly improve the traffic flow at this critical junction. The system to system interchange will has recently shown up as the fifth worst truck bottleneck in the US, according to the American Transportation Research Institute report. The delivery model for this one will be design build finance with five to six years of construction and repayment taking place three to five years post substantial completion. Costing plan development is around 90%. Uh, costing plans not only help us identify the environmental impacts to get them addressed, it also helps identify risks and constructability issues likely to be encountered during construction. For example, we've identified likely locations where some detours would be needed and have prepared ahead for those likelihoods. The project team has engaged and received feedback from local municipalities and other stakeholders and will continue to do so. There is broad support for this project. Right-of-way plans have been developed and accelerated. Early acquisition is proceeding. The total parcel count you might wonder about is approximately 131 parcels. And I would emphasize that most of these parcels are, uh, are just sliver type of takes. They're not total takes. So to give you a sense of that. The environmental assessment is at Federal Highway for review, and we anticipate a public hearing later this year as we move forward towards NEPA approval. And finally, the anticipated P3 procurement initiation will be the fourth quarter this year, leading to anticipated letting in 2024. Next, let's discuss the 75 CVL project. The I-75 commercial vehicle lanes project is very innovative undertaking for us. It is the first of its kind in the US. Toll free and barrier separated lanes will be constructed in the northbound direction on I-75, beginning at the I-475 interchange near Macon and extending northward to the south side of McDonough area. The lanes will be operated as mandatory for commercial vehicles unless they have a local destination. General traffic will be prohibited. The project also facilitates the use of future connected and automated vehicle technologies, something we're all keen to understand and see where it's going. The project will be delivered using a design build finance maintain approach with availability payments to occur in the operations phase for 35 years plus or minus yet to be determined. The right of way plans are in progress and will be moving forward with early acquisitions uh, where appropriate. There are pro approximately 193 parcels to acquire for this particular project. Environmental technical studies are complete and the team is, is advancing NEPA activities in alignment with the procurement schedule. And this exciting uh, P3 procurement will start in the first quarter of 2025. And the anticipated letting will occur projecting the third quarter of 2026. And now I will turn it back to our chief engineer, Meg. Thank you, Daryl. So you've heard our vision for mobility in Georgia. We've discussed the GDOT CERTA partnership in delivering express lanes and our vision for transit in these express lanes. We've presented our concerted efforts to balance and address contractor risk. You've heard our procurement details for our remaining MMIP program, and we've completed a lot of work on the MMIP, the biggest highway P3 program in the country and we've been very successful. We've awarded several contracts and we are currently underway in procurement for the DBF contract on the I-285-I-20 East Interchange. 
So what is next? This, this is it. This is the procurement schedule for the remaining MMIP projects. This schedule reflects our responsiveness to your concerns about procurement capacity. We've prioritized the project procurements with recognition that the pipeline capacity for procurements is no more than three overlapping procurements at a time, and we've staggered them to allow for the most comp competition. Georgia 400 will advance first, and the NOIA will be posted tomorrow. We will offer opportunities for State Route 400 one-on-one -on -one meetings the week of March 7th, as Tim said. The I-285 Top End Express Lane procurement will follow Georgia 400 in 2023. Timing for 285 Top End procurements, the initial segments, will allow for the outcome of previous procurements to be known before submitting the next SOQ. This schedule advances the I-285, I-20 West interchange in 2023 prior to the 75 commercial vehicle lanes. Extension or PDA options for the 285 East and West express lanes are beyond the timeline shown here. We will of course hold industry events and one-on-one -on -one meetings for each procurement as they progress. And we look forward to hearing more of your feedback as we all move ahead together. Our focus is better infrastructure, better projects, and advancing the greater goals for mobility in the Atlanta region and Georgia with you as our partners. I am so grateful for your interest and your participation up to now and through today and in the future. Thank you for taking the time to engage over the last year to offer your feedback and to help improve our policies, practices, and drive toward a better transportation system in Georgia. People are welcome to stay and mingle. We have this room till lunchtime, so please stay and talk and network. And um, thank you again so much for being here.